Good morning. Hard to believe it's the first Sunday in September. The fall is on the way. Football season has started, so it's a, a, a good time for us all. Uh, a couple of notes. Uh, Kelly Bartholomew's uh, uncle passed away this past week, and we had that funeral yesterday. His name was Rick, and uh, we keep him in a, their family in the prayers. And Phyllis Rush passed away yesterday, and uh, the Rushes. Thanks for all of us for our prayers for, for Phyllis over the years, and uh, funeral arrangements have not been finalized, but we'll let you know when that, when that occurs. There is a card in the narthex of for the Russians. And so Amor gave me a, a very, very welcome note to read this morning, and that is there's going to be an ice cream party coming up. And that'll be the 18th. It'll be right after worship, and uh, so bring your favorite ice cream and, uh, and topping and join us for a fellowship hour. Um, Nancy reminds you that Mike's favorite flavor, flavors are chocolate and chocolate mint chips. So just to remind you about that. But we will have a great time and looking forward to it. Thanks, Nancy. Any other announcements to share this morning? David? confess to you. God of all the saints, God of all the sinners, hear our prayer. We would be saint-like, holy, good, patient, and loving, but we end up feeling more like sinners, full of failures of morality, selfish, mean. Perhaps you see us as simply human, as beloved and flawed, and trying, and failing, and succeeding. In all of this, Forgive the wrong that we have done and bless the good that we have accomplished. Keep on loving us and helping us and molding us more and more into the image of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. 
Friends, we hear this marvelous good news every week. The love of God is beyond measure. And we are included in that love. We need to know that we are forgiven and thus free to love and to serve. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. <clears throat> Done you 
any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back, not to mention that you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. The Gospel reading is from Luke chapter 14, verses 25 to 35. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate your cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't you first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against them with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not <coughs> give up anything you have cannot be my disciples. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Ascends the readings for today.
And then we're also glad to have you back with us this morning. So glad to see you, Nick Gary. As Bush was reading, I, I thought it is often we get to read the entirety of uh, one of the books of the Bible on Sunday morning. But uh, Paul's letter to Philemon is a, is a short one, but I think one of the more important ones for us to, to hear. There's a joke that's uh, circulating on, on Facebook. It's about, about a guy named Bob. Bob is single. Bob lives with his dad. Bob and his dad run a pretty darn successful business. It became apparent that his dad was, was getting on in years and uh, his health was failing a bit. Uh, it occurred to Bob that pretty soon he was going to be a very rich fellow. He was going to inherit that business. And he decided it was about time for him to find a wife with whom he could share all that wealth. So one evening he went to an investment meeting and he spotted what he said was the most beautiful woman in the world. She absolutely took his, his breath away. He walked up to her and, and said, you know, I may just look like an ordinary guy, but uh, in a couple of years my dad's going to die. And I'll be worth about $200 million. Well, she seemed suitably impressed and uh, she said, can I have your car? Three days later, that remarkably beautiful woman who took his breath away became his stepmother. <laughs> This was a person who had a plan for, for success. And everybody needs a plan. And, and it was a remarkably changing world. It doesn't matter how old we are, we need a plan. The business world changes every moment. And, and maybe our goal isn't to uh, marry a, a witch widower, but the world is changing. And we better be prepared. Dan Miller wrote an interesting book not too long ago. It's called No More Dreaded Mondays. And he tells us about all the changes that are occurring in, in America's workplace. He, he enumerates the number of jobs that have been lost because of technology, and also as a result of foreign competition. You know, a lot of us like to use ATMs. They're remarkably convenient, and we use them on a pretty regular basis. As you use that, just think that because of the ATMs, 147,000 tellers who used to greet us with a smile at the bank are no longer working. We talked about the post office. The post office is, is full of problems. Some time ago, they put in uh, site recognition machines that took 47,000 postal jobs away in the blink of an eye. It's startling, but, but it's being faced by a remarkable number of, of employees. The foreign competition, you probably read the articles about it, but, but a lot of American workers are being coerced into training their foreign counterparts than losing their jobs. Those foreign counterparts are going to continue to work for almost a fraction of the American hourly wage. The world's changing. Job security is no longer an issue. I sat next to a fellow the other day in a waiting room, and uh, as we got into conversation, he said he'd been in the Navy. When he left the Navy, he went to work for Bethlehem Steel. He worked for Bethlehem Steel for 28 years before he retired. He said, I retired before I wanted to because Bethlehem Steel failed. It used to be you'd go to work for Bethlehem Steel, and you'd live work near their entire career and live with a pretty good retirement. No more. The executives had a pretty good retirement. The workers got put out to, out to the farm. The world's changing remarkably fast. And we have to be prepared. It was kind of interesting. It used to be if a person came into a, brought their resume in and they had three or four or five job changes in 10 years, you say, that's a real red flag. We're not interested in, in those people. What we found out was that uh, today, Multiple jobs is considered to be a positive when people come in for a resume. An article I read a while ago said that the average person between 18 and 40 will have about 11 different jobs by the time they retire. A lot of folks in this congregation had one job for the entirety of their lives. When Catherine and I spend some time talking to, uh, to students at Raven, getting ready to graduate, or working with high school students or an honors program and taking some leadership courses, one of the things we find out is that guidance counselors are telling them they better live their lives like entrepreneurs. They want to be in control of their own life and, and not be responsible or uh, hang on to uh, their employers. You know, during the pandemic, a lot of people work from home. They get tired of, of mundane, every, every average jobs. They were tired of being underpaid and, and underappreciated. They left their jobs in droves. That's providing a significant challenge for, for employers. An article in uh, the Morning Call a couple of days ago that said Pennsylvania is short 125,000 workers. The Lehigh Valley is short about 11,000 workers. 
And the world has shifted from an employer-based organization to an employee-based education. When, when particularly kids in college begin to come to us and ask for advice about career choice, I usually end the conversation with, with, with this admonition. If it's not fun, don't do it. I've been remarkably lucky that virtually every day of my life I've had fun where I work. It's been enjoyable. Tell them, don't get to a situation where you don't want to go to work, where you work with people that you don't like. If it's not fun, don't do it. And that's becoming a word in the, in the environment. But Jesus talks a little bit about that, because making a living has always required some diligence, hasn't it? Jesus knew exactly what it was required to, to succeed in the world. Forget that he spent the majority of his life as a businessman. He spent the majority of his life as a, as a carpenter. Maybe he could have had a more successful career or a successful career as a, as a contractor. And so we see some of that reflected in, in today's gospel lesson from, from Luke. See some of Jesus' business background. You know, there were a lot of folks who were beginning to follow him. He was becoming quite a celebrity. And he wanted to be sure they knew exactly what they were getting into. He knew that unbridled enthusiasm has its place. But it has to be tempered with, with, with reason. So Jesus uses this analogy. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to, to complete the project? For you simply go ahead and lay the foundation and aren't able to fix it. Everyone who sees it will understand that you didn't have the money. They'll laugh at you, they'll ridicule you. They say this person began to build and, and wasn't able to, to finish, wasn't able to, to follow through. And then he uses another analogy. He said, we're supposed to king who's preparing to go to war against another king, will first uh, sit down and consider whether his 10,000 soldiers can, can effectively deal with the, his opponent's 20,000 soldiers. And if he thinks they can't, he's going to send a delegation to the other side to try to sell things peaceably before they engage in battle. He said, very important sentence. In the same way, those of you who do not give everything you have cannot be my disciples. Those of you who don't give away, don't, don't, don't give up everything you have, cannot be my disciples. And I think you're stating a very, very solid spiritual principle and a very practical principle. People fail in business, people fail in life. And often the reasons are exactly the same. One fellow said, uh, kind of sadly, I started out with this theory, that the world had an opening for me, and I was right it did. And I'm at the bottom of that hole right now. And I think we all know people who have been in that position. Jesus says to the person who won't sit down and count the cost whether you're building a tower or conducting a military campaign or building a life for themselves, they find themselves in a deep hole. Successful living begins with a plan. And I'm always amazed how many people really fail to plan. There's an old saying that you've heard before, people who fail to plan, plan to fail. I was reading about an Englishman, his name was Lyle Burley, it was back in the 1960s, and he decided he was gonna become a newspaper man. He wasn't really happy with the news coverage he was getting from the, from the average British newspaper. So he decided it was time to publish his own, and he formed a corporation called the Commonwealth Sentinel. And he worked diligently, he worked very hard, he, he wrote articles, he promoted the new, the, the newspaper on billboards, he sold advertising space, he printed up to 50,000 copies. He was determined to make that first edition of his paper a success. And so on February 6, 1965, as the newspaper left the printers, an exhausted Burley was resting in his hotel, we got a phone call from the London police. Do you have anything to do with the, London, the Commonwealth Sentinel? The officer asked. Well, there are 50,000 copies of those newspapers sitting outside in the middle of the street. And you're blocking traffic. With the hundreds of details he had to deal with, he overlooked one critical one. He never got to the street. He never found the newspaper people who would make that newspaper fill, sell on the streets. There they were sitting in the middle of the street, blocking traffic. Well, the Commonwealth Simple failed that very day. You know, he was a, probably a good fellow, probably a fine man, he probably worked very hard, he's probably a smart, pretty ways, but he, he failed to do the most important thing to find a way to distribute that newspaper. I'd like to 
came and brought too few soldiers to the battle. He didn't have all the necessary contingencies taken into account. No matter where we are in life, we need to continue to plan. So there's one question I'd like to have us consider today. What kind of legacy do we, what kind of legacy do we hope to live for those we love, to the world and, and for our community? What kind of legacy do we want to leave behind? Because one of these days we're, we're all going to be leaving the earth. The question becomes, how are people going to, to remember us? In what ways will Easton or this church or our nation be, a, be better because we happen to be? I keep going back to, to Stephen Covey. That remarkable book published now, what seems to be ages ago, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And he suggests we need to begin our lives with the end in mind. Yes, the question, if you were to die tomorrow, what would you leave behind? Which values would you want to pass on to your heirs? Are you living those values right now? When we get to the end of our lives, will we do so with, with significant requests? What will our friends say about us? What will our family members say about us? Those are, are pretty darn big questions. They've got to be answered if we're going to have anything close to a successful life, no matter where we are. The great business guru, uh, Peter Drucker, says this. He said his life was shaped by a question that one teacher asked him. What will you be remembered for? Drucker said, I was only 13 when I heard that question. I said, I, I didn't have an answer. The teacher went on to say, I didn't expect you to be able to, to respond. But if you still can't answer that question by the time you're 50, you will have wasted your life. It was a wise teacher. Peter Drucker passed that question along to, to my friend uh, and Eastern resident, uh, Francis Hesselbein. Francis Hesselbein is 106 years old and still going strong. Uh, she's now the CEO of the Francis, Francis Hesselbein uh, Graduate School of Public Affairs at the Johnson Institute for Republic Responsible Leadership. That's quite the title. CEO of the Francis Hesselbein Graduate School of Public Affairs at the Johnson Institute for Responsible Leadership. Francis worked side by side with Peter Drucker in 666 Fifth Avenue for many years. He said that she was the finest executive in the United States, not the finest executive in the world. She was one time the executive of the Girl Scouts of America and influenced tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of, of, of young girls, the finest executive <coughs> in the world. Peter Mumsey, in his book Legacy Now, notes that there are about 80 million boomers in America. That's us. He said, one of them turns 70 yet every six seconds. The youngest are at the end of their 60s. He said, most are in the 70s and 80s. He said, that's created a huge interest he makes on to say that what he calls midlife or end life evaluation. He said, most, if not all, boomers feel it's time to make a change. The evaluation Mumsy says is, 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 a, is bringing a transition from the me to we world, from the take world to the give world. He said it's a remarkably healthy transition. So by necessity, Kathleen and I found this, we're going through our basement after doing some construction. Uh, we're moving from, a, moving from the more is more lifestyle to the uh, less is more worldview. German psychiatrist, uh, Eric, Eric Erickson said that that's a remarkably important way to look at the world. So when people become aware of, of the need to give beyond themselves, they begin the difficult task of, of leading a meaningful and useful life. That's the worldview that Jesus encouraged, isn't it? So the question for us is what kind of legacy do, do you hope to leave to those who, who love you and to the world? Herbuth Luce in, in uh, 1962. She was one of the first women to serve in, in Congress. She offered this advice in a conversation with John Kennedy. She said, a great man is a sentence. A great man is a sentence. 
Abraham Lincoln's sentence was, he preserved the union and freed the slaves. Franklin Roosevelt's sentence was, he lifted us out of the Great Depression and helped us win a world war. She said to Kennedy, she was afraid that his attention was so splintered among different priorities <laughs> that his sentence risked becoming a, a, a muddled paragraph. So as we think about ourselves on this Sunday morning, as we contemplate our, our purpose in life, our plan for life, I think we need to begin with the question, <clears throat> what is our sentence? If you're a football fan, uh, you probably remember the name Bubba Smith. Bubba Smith was a defensive end for, for Michigan State. Um, <clears throat> Bubba Smith at one time came face to face with his sentence, and he didn't like it. He was All-American defensive end at Michigan State. He went on and was drafted in the first round by the pros. He, uh, I guess it was 1967. He played for nine years in the pros. He was named two pro balls and once was a first team All-Pro. <clears throat> after his retirement, he, he was recruited uh, to appear at commercials for, for Miller Beer, Miller Light Beer. And he along, went along with his buddy Dick Butkus, the former linebacker for the Chicago Bears. And they cashed them as, <clears throat> as inept golfers and, and pro players, uh, polo players. <clears throat> I think most of you might be able to repeat the, the central line from a lot of those beer commercials was less filling, tastes great, right? Well, one of the funny, funniest commercials they had in that, that was uh, Bubba Smith talking about Miller Lite and saying, I also love the easy opening cans. And he grabbed the top of the can and ripped the can apart. Remarkably big and strong fellow. Made a lot of money on those ads, and eventually he walked away from, from that job because he didn't like the effect it was having on, on people. And he realized it was contributing to it to a significant social problem. He said this, <clears throat> that neither beer nor any alcoholic beverage had ever had been a part of his life. But he advertised Miller Lite because it felt good, I had a good time, was easy, and they paid, paid a good salary. He said, one day I was back at Michigan State and I was leading the, the, the Alumni Day Parade, the homecoming parade, he was the Grand Marshal. He said, that riding in the, in the limousine at, at the head of the parade were throngs of people on both sides of the street. And they were shouting, one side said, taste great, the other side said, less fill. He said, I realized that, that he and the beer commercials had made an enormous impact upon young people at Michigan State. So later, I was in uh, Fort Lauderdale during spring break, and I saw a bunch of drunken college kids on the beach shouting the same thing. Tastes great, less fill. So when I came to renew my contract, I had this little voice in the back of my head that said, don't do it. Stop. Stop. He didn't want his, his sentence to be, taste great, let's fill it. So he decided to change, and he, he walked away. So what sentence will one day summarize your life? He, he, was, he or she was a, was a successful business owner. He or she was very active in their church. He, he wasn't very patient. So think I've got a card for this. He always had the coolest cars. Wouldn't it be nice if the, our sentence was, he or she was a genuine disciple of Jesus Christ? Jesus was addressing folks who wanted to be part of, of, of his father, who wanted to be his disciples, and he wanted them to understand what was involved. He wanted them to be willing to give up everything they had to follow him. Can we do that? What would be our one sentence legacy? Former Secretary of, of, of State Madeleine Albright once told a very moving story about the horror of 9 11. It involved a passenger, one passenger in particular in Flight 93, the one that went down in Pennsylvania. That passenger's name was Tom Burnett. He called his wife from that hijacked plane. He realized the two other planes had <coughs> crashed into the World Trade Center. He said, I know we're going to die. No, we're going to die, but some of us are going to do something about it. And because they did, many, many other lives were saved. I know we're going to die. It's a totally unremarkable statement. We talked about it over coffee earlier this morning. 
Each one of us could say the same thing because it's bound to happen. Each one of us, I know we're going to die. But those other words are the important words for us. Some of us are going to do something about it. What an incredibly inspiring one sentence legacy. So, what will be our legacy? What will be the one sentence you want, we want someone to remember about our lives? Are we living that life out right now? Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough to complete it? Or suppose the king is about to go to war and gets to know the king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he has, <clears throat> whether he's able with 10,000, whether he's able with 10,000 men to uh, defeat the other king coming against him with 20,000 men? In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. So the question we can ask ourselves is, what's our mission in life? What will our sentence be? And are we living according to that mission and that sentence today? Amen. Please stand. Let us affirm our faith together. We believe in God, created our world and every living thing in it, because all people in all places are God's children. We believe they have the right to be treated with dignity. We believe in Jesus Christ, who died on the cross to save us from our sins. We understand and believe that the power of his redeeming grace is available to all who seek it. As recipients of that grace, we also believe we are called to live out and share the good news of the gospel. We believe in the power of the Holy Spirit to make all things new through God's grace and love. As we are forgiven, so we must forgive others. We believe in the triune God who continues to create, wash us clean in the baptismal water, and inspire and empower us to serve in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's sing our next hymn together, Make Me a Captive Lord.
We bring our prayer before our Heavenly Father this morning. Does remember Charlie Bartholomew? David Ian and them. And Judy Reed and David Wadmersey. And Tom and Lynn Bogart. Bob McPherson and the Rush family. And Marjorie Hammer and David Freitag and all those others whom we carry in our hearts. May we pray. Disturb us, Lord. Disturb us, Lord, when we are too pleased with ourselves, when our dreams have come true because we dream too little, when we arrive safely because we fail, sailed too close to the shore. Disturb us, Lord, when with the abundance of things we possess, we have lost our thirst for the waters of life, having fallen in love with life, we have ceased to dream of eternity. In our efforts to build a new earth, We've allowed our vision of the new heaven to dim. Disturb us, Lord, to dare more boldly, to venture on wider seas where storms will show your majesty, where losing sight of land we shall find the stars. We ask you to push back the horizons of our hopes and push us into the future in strength, courage, hope, and love. This we ask in the name of our captain, who is Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please stand for a prayer of dedication. Gracious Spirit, you have showered us with your gifts, and we embrace you with thanksgiving. And our embrace with your arms wide open, ready to share, to serve, and to love. Use our spiritual gifts that we may live the spiritual life, moving according to the Spirit's heated touch and bending in the direction of God's holy world.
finally go out as disciples of Jesus Christ, marked by his love. When we share that love, we reveal God. May the Spirit continue to stir your heart, moving you to new acts of love every day, that all may know the good news of God's love today. Amen. Mm -hmm.